The concept of freedom of the press predates the United States Constitution. And it started right here in colonial New York. The royal governor of colonial New York in 1733 was Bill Cosby. No relation. <laughs> it has, falls in your lap sometimes. <laughs> and Zenger was publishing articles in his newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, attacking Cosby for rigging elections, for corruption, and for being a fool. That, those are what his articles were about. Cosby got annoyed, obviously. He had Zenger arrested. He charged Zenger with seditious libel. And in English common law, it didn't have to be true or false to be charged with seditious libel. It just had to be against the government. So if you wrote anything against the government, you were charged and put in prison for seditious libel. Zenger sat in jail for a full year until his trial came. They couldn't get a lawyer to represent him because Cosby kept debarring the lawyers that they would pick. <laughs> Finally, they get Andrew Hamilton, no relation to Alexander. Hamilton was an eminent lawyer in Philadelphia, and they brought Hamilton in to defend Zenger. Hamilton knew that Zenger was guilty. Libel, as was understood, uh, was true for Zenger. He had published the articles. They had libeled the governor. So Hamilton turned to the jury, and he said to the jury, nullify this law. He said to the jury, this law prevents people from making a truthful complaint. And a here's the quote. He said, the truth is the defense against libel. And he told the jury that they had the power to set a limit on what a governor or a king could do to them. He said, do not punish a man for telling the truth. Fabulous. If Steve were here <laughs> and we were talking, we would start talking about how this led to the revolution, this led to independence, this led to the First Amendment. It would be on and on about how this was so important, that this set the tone for the American Revolution we could, go on, we could go on like that, and I loved it. That jury's action, they declared Zenger not guilty, that established the principle that the press should be free. Based on that principle, in 1791, the First Amendment to the Constitution was adopted, part of the Bill of Rights, and it stated, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Done. Well. Despite this amendment to our Constitution, you laugh because we've lived through this, <laughs> almost in defiance of the Constitution, which is part of our Bill of Rights, seven years later, Congress passes the Sedition Act. And the Sedition Act bans criticism of the government. Huh? President John Adams ordered the arrest of 25 newspaper editors. Many of them served jail time. One of them was Ben Franklin's grandson. And it became a major debate in America. Adams was criticized for preventing the free flow of information. Um, Thomas Jefferson, who then is running against Adams for president of the United States, takes this as his campaign. And he defeats John Adams in the campaign under the banner of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And in his inauguration, Jefferson says to the American people that you have the guaranteed right to think freely, to speak, and write what you think. Now, we know the press has often been censored during wartime and in the name of national security. I see the nodding. We know this. Well. Here's what Steve wrote, which surprised me. And then I looked it up and checked it, because we go back and forth on this. During the Civil War, uh-oh, stay there. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln was responsible for the greatest newspaper suppression in our nation's history. Our Abe Lincoln, responsible for the greatest suppression 
of newspapers in our nation's history. On the eve of the Civil War, there were 4,000 newspapers in circulation, most very political. Many of those newspapers portrayed Lincoln as a dictator, that he was oversympathetic to African Americans, and Lincoln conducted what has been called the Salem Witch Hunt of the Civil War. Bless you. 200 newspapers and their editors were subjected, subjected to menacing federal agents and union troops. A number of newspaper editors were imprisoned at Fort Lafayette, right off the coast of Brooklyn, right off of Bay Ridge. One of the towers of the Verrazano Bridge sits on the island where Fort Lafayette was located. And I think it was Francis Scott Key's grandson was an editor in Baltimore, was put in prison there. It became known as the American Bastille, that so many people were in prison there because of their politics and because they were running newspapers. Well, this attack on freedom of the press under the banner of defending our nation is front page news today. A reporter in this building, James Rice, was on the witness stand yesterday in federal court, refusing to answer questions that could help the Justice Department identify his confidential sources. Mr. Risen, in a public speech, noted the most controversial aspects of, of the government's response to the September 11th terrorist attacks, drones, waterboarding, secret prisons, and more, took place in secret. If you took away all that the press revealed about the war on terror, you would know virtually nothing about the history of the last 13 years. Wow. The message to the press is clear. If you challenge the government, you will face punishment. It's John Pinger's, Peter Zenger's battle all over again. As Andrew Hamilton warned the jury 280 years ago, right here in New York, do not punish a man for telling the truth. Stephen Levine, I miss you. And would have delighted in a discussion about freedom of the press. Thank you very much.